These animals grow out of the seabed like a living question mark, capturing exactly how the deep sea makes us feel, diving into an ocean of unexplained questions. Often when I look through deep sea footage, I find myself thinking, what the heck's that? So I thought I'd share a few of the stranger things discovered in the ocean and see if you have that same feeling. I'll give you a moment to guess what you think each of the following are, although I'm sure sometimes you'll have a better idea than I do. By the way, welcome to my 200th video. I've been making these for over 10 years and have learnt a lot. Like the deeper you go, the stranger it gets. It's great you've dived in. Thanks for watching. So, let the deep sea mysteries go on. What about that question mark? A deep sea feather? Or something stranger? Anchored in mud, swaying gently, it looks like a plume or a fern. But it's a colony of animals called a sea pen. Closely related to corals and anemones. And like corals, they've got polyps. Each with a task. Some catch drifting plankton using sticky tentacles, and some push water through the colony's channels. And if it feels threatened, it can even retreat fully into the sediment. A few species even glow when touched, like an underwater alarm signal. These unidentified swimming objects are the aliens from our own planet. And there's stranger yet to come. Some of the smallest things in the deep are the most beautiful and mysterious. This certainly gave me the what's that response. It's the bony-eared ass fish, of course. And it's a reverse ugly duckling story, because this is what the adult looks like. It's a type of cusk eel that lives 8,000 feet, 2,500 metres down. I couldn't resist animating that beautiful picture of the larval fish and this is what it might look like swimming. And this is another closely related species. But how does it get that funny name, the bony-eared ass fish? Well, it's difficult to see, but on this diagram there's a spine at the top of the gill plate, which is where it gets the bony bit from. And what about the ass? Well, that's part of its Greek science name, Acanthonus. And it's a playful interpretation of onus, which in Greek is donkey or ass. So there you have it. Right, this is the one I've been really waiting to tell you about. But is it even an animal or just some fabric left on the seabed? It's got no brain, no eyes and no gut. It's just a mouth with some basic tissue layers and a lot of evolutionary mystery. And it's known as the purple sock worm. And like most socks, its partner is nowhere to be found. Many of the six known species are found around cold vents, which are places where gases seep through the sea floor, and there's lots of clams. It's thought that it feeds on the clams in some way, because there's DNA of clams inside some of the collected samples. But since it can't easily open a clam, being a bit sort of floppy, there's a question mark as to whether it's actually eating the clam or its eggs or even mucus around the clam. Here are some of the other species of Xenotabellas, the sockworms. A red species, a see-through species, and a giant species known as Monstrosa, which has this texture underneath. Despite appearances, they're not related to flatworms or mollusks, but instead they're some of the earliest animals right at the base of the evolutionary tree. They're unusual additions to a sock drawer. Is this an eel or another kind of fish, or some sort of ghost from the deep? Known as a smooth and pale, sounds like a beer, a pink ling or pink cusk eel. It's eel-like, but not an eel because it has petrol fins on the side. It's a stealth feeder in its natural habitat and lurks along the seabed, using suction to snap up its prey. Its lateral line, which is a big sort of scar on the side, detects vibrations and allows it to hunt in the darkness. Despite its appearance, it's a commercially important species in the southern hemisphere, trawled from New Zealand to Chile, and no doubt threatened by the fishery. 
The deep sea will never let us down for stranger things. Little white balls dangling on strings. But what's its game? This is the ping pong tree sponge, with more ping pongs than are found in the average packet. Most sponges are filter feeders, picking up on bacteria and other detritus. But this, identified barely 30 years ago, is a more bloodthirsty type, a carnivorous sponge, feeding on small animals, zooplankton, which it cunningly traps with a variety of microscopic spines that look like medieval torture instruments. I can't find a detailed microscopic picture of how the spines fit on the spheres, but I've mocked it up and so it's possibly something like this. At any rate, the spines seem very effective because this is the result when little zooplankton stick to them. There's no stomach, but special cells within the sponge migrate towards the prey, envelop it, and digest it directly. Four or five species are known, and many of them have only been found in recent years. This one was found just over ten years ago, and for obvious reasons, it's called the harp sponge. There's still a lot of research to be done, but it seems, in this species at least, the ping-pong balls have a reproductive function too. OK, time for another mysterious deep-sea fish. Told you I was going to give you a bit of time to guess what it is. It lives deep, down to 10,000 feet. It glides slowly with oversized eyes and a downturned mouth, like it's fed up with the abyss. The Pacific flat-nose thrives where light barely reaches, feeding on crustaceans and soft-bodied prey, and it hunts them out in the dark, with pressure-sensitive receptors and chemosensory pores that almost taste the water. Although it can be found off the coast of California, it lives in cold waters, way up to the Bering Sea, and has antifreeze proteins in its blood, designed for survival near freezing point. Oh, what is that? It might be. It, might yeah, it looks like a, a it, it looks like an octopus or a squid. The scientist is talking about what the animal is eating, not what it is, because she knows that. But what do you think? Spiders underwater? Does that seem likely? But some of you might know they're called pycnogonids. They're found all over the ocean and they're surprisingly successful. There's about 1,300 species. Although they look like spiders, they're only distantly related. They've got a much reduced central abdomen and a lot of their major organs are inside their legs. Those two yellow patches where you'd expect the eyes to be are in fact just pigments because they're the remnants of eyes, and in the deeper species of pycnogonids, there's no eyes. Instead, in the dark, they find their prey by using vibration and chemical senses. Under the electron microscope, you can see the fine detail of these sensory bristles. There's more packed into the front, as you'd expect. Despite how fragile they look, pycnogonids have weathered mass extinctions and ocean upheavals and have been around for hundreds of millions of years. Next up in the What's That stakes, this looks like a pink ribbon making trails on the seabed, but it's truly alive. It wriggles through the sediment, filtering out organic matter. This improbable animal is called the rosy acorn worm, and before you judge whether it's really as weird as it looks, it has a big nerve cord going down its back, just like us, and is a not-so-distant relation of all the vertebrates, though it chose a, a much squishier path. So what are these regular stone-like clusters doing on the seabed? Are they natural? These are geodia sponges, arranged like stone mosaics across the seabed. Cut in half, you can see their spongy texture. Reminds me a bit of a crunchy bar in the UK. But inside those tiny pores are filtering cells called coanocytes, which almost all sponges have. 
except for those carnivorous ones, if you remember from earlier. Classic Antarctic habitats. Sponge beds down here. Just everywhere you look. Lots of sponges. These large sponge grounds, or oystur, as they're called in Icelandic, meaning cheese, are found over all the world's oceans, but especially in the Atlantic and in the colder areas, and all very deep. Like most habitats that have structure and shelter, they're really important, these sponge beds, for all the animals that live among them. Many kinds of starfish. Some not very easily identified deep-sea fish. This is probably a kind of fathead sculpin, a.k.a. a blobfish before it's been dragged up from the sea. And this is likely a blackfin icefish. And even the stems of carnivorous sea squirts live amongst the sponges. Like a Venus flytrap, it's shut its mouth on some sort of crustacean. One interesting theory for why they cluster is that it improves the water flow around the sponges and makes it easier for them to filter feed. Trawlers try to avoid them because the tons of sponges which can be caught in the nets will break them. Is this one creature or a floating society adrift in the sea? Not a single animal, but a cooperative colony there's a distinctive bit at the front which can be red, yellow or even see-through. Or in fact some kind of fluorescent green. It's called the nectosome and it's the propulsion unit pushing out squirts of water to move the whole creature along. The gastrozooids behind digest food and the little tentilla deliver stings to capture prey. The whole thing is known as an apolema siphonophore. Fittingly, aponema means separate threads in Greek. Surprisingly, they're related to the fearsome Portuguese man of war, which is also a siphonophore, and more distantly to corals and anemones. It's a deep sea modular biology, many specialised parts drifting but bound together in one seamless form. Is this creature hiding or showing off? Covered in curved but smooth interlocking plates, it clings to a rock and silently folds its parapodia, paired paddle-like limbs it uses to crawl and sense its surroundings with. I thought at first it was a chitin, a type of mollusk which has eight plates, but this has got more than eight plates, and what's confusing is it has retracted its feet, so it doesn't look like the scale worm, which I think it is. This is what they're more normally like. You can see the legs, but also the interlocking scales. It's interesting that it really has locked itself down into a sort of barrel. A little bit in the same way garden snails do in the winter when they're hibernating. But that's just speculation and shows how little we know still about these sort of creatures. I'm sorry, by the way, if you've looked at the community post and didn't get an answer for quite a while, because it took me some time to put this together. Warnica suggested it might be a isopod, a type of underwater woodlouse. Benjamin Ford, 9932, guessed a sea slater, which is, again, a, a large type of woodlouse thing. I think they might be called sea roaches in the USA. And SK8 Misteron, put forward some kind of cocoon, which I also thought at first a kind of egg sac. They're all solid guesses. Turns out it's probably a glamorous scale worm with its feet up, having a rest. By the way, you wouldn't think it, but some species of scale worms can be surprisingly feisty, like this blue one. Not sure what that's about, but one of them is clearly not happy. I really could go on. There are so many times when I've had to double take at a sea creature or research what the heck it is that I'm looking at. All strange, mysterious and sometimes just absurd. And yet, of course, we're only scratching the depths. And of course, thanks for watching my 200th video. Let me know which creature made you pause or which one you still don't quite believe. 
I'm still deciding myself. Oh, and I forgot to tell you, these are cactus urchins, and this is footage taken only last year on a Schmidt Ocean Institute voyage. They've got really small mouths, and some people think they might be filter feeders, which is really unusual for urchins. But then again, they're pretty deep. OK, until next time. You can tell me if you want something in particular, and I'll try to make a video on it. I think those blackwater fish are really beautiful and I might do something on blackwater drift diving and the larvae and small life forms that divers have got at night. <laughs>